First, you'll need to recrystallize your sample. You don't have to, but you probably should. And then select the crystal you want to use. You'll usually do this under a polarizing microscope, where pure crystals will extinguish the light every 90 degrees. Once you've selected your crystal, you'll need to mount it on the pin, a thin glass thread which is frustratingly fragile. The first two I used, I broke. So to do this, you'll want to have mounted your crystals on a slide in Paratone, a viscous glycerol-like liquid which makes isolating a crystal easier. Having selected your crystal, you should transfer it into wax, seen here on the end of the microscope slide. The wax makes sticking the crystal right on the tip of the pin far easier. Once done, mount the pin under nitrogen flow, in this case from the blue nozzle, and centre the crystal in the x-ray beam. Unfortunately, I couldn't work out how to run split screen in my editing software, so you'll just have to watch the crystal's movements and my adjustments one after another. There, now it's centred. So now that you have your crystal mounted, you need to determine your unit cell, and this is done by collecting preliminary diffraction data often referred to as the matrix run. This only takes a matter of minutes, and it's worth noting that the matrix calculation is only a minor part of this step, and the matrix is only for converting the crystal's unit cell axes in space relative to the X-ray beam to the unit cell axes we see on our screens. What it actually produces is something like this, however I shall try to describe it in two dimensions. The reason that this preliminary run can be so fast is because the position of a spot is relatively easily predicted once you have the first two or three. For example, if your first three spots are these black ones, then you'd predict that the remaining spots would be where these green ones are, and you can send the detector around and check. This may give you a unit cell that looks like this. However, it's worth noting that in this preliminary unit cell determination, any axis H, K or L of your cell could be an integer value of the actual parameter and you've just found a set of unit cells. For example, if this orange spot were a missed spot and this red spot a systematic absence, then all of a sudden red spots appear at these positions and orange spots at these. Of course the red spots are absences, so you actually get spots at these purple points. This would mean that the unit cell you've calculated is eight times too small, and the actual unit cell is this green one. They are, however, the same unit cell, just different sizes. It is worth noting that these preliminary unit cell parameters only tell you what shape box contains your repeating unit, not the contents of the box itself. This information is obtained in the main data collection run. This run can take up to 24 hours if you have a difficult sample, but generally will only be a couple of hours. So now you can go grab something to eat.